1936. Two-time Indy winner Louis Meyer struggled just to make the field. But after starting 28, Meyer was able to take the lead on lap 89, stretch his limited fuel supply, and take the checkered flag to become Indy's first ever three-time winner. Hello, I'm Paul Page. Louis Meyer's achievement came at a time when the track was brick. 150 miles an hour was unthinkable, and a brush with the wall usually meant flying over it. But Meyer, who first came to Indy as a mechanic, was able to beat the odds and become one of the original legends at the Indy 500, a race for heroes. Out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, Louis Meyer enjoys the serenity of life, the wide open spaces. The air is fresh, the weather is warm, and the pace is slow, especially for a three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500. But in Louis's era, the race itself was slower, sometimes taking more than five hours to complete. The appearance of the speedway was different as well. A pagoda towered over the brick-paved track. There was no pit wall, and the AAA was the sanctioning body. Despite many differences, the excitement of a day at the race was still the same. When I think of the racetrack, my mind goes back to the first time balloon tires were used on the speedway. Out in the glare of the heat of that sun-beaten track, a boy sitting behind the wheel of the car he loves, driving with the skill of a master, not with his hands and feet, but with his heart and soul and a pair of baby shoes lashed to the front of his car. The speed is terrific. For the first time in the history, the average is over 100 miles per hour. And then the checkered flag, Peter De Palma, using balloon tires, Firestone gum dip balloon tires, for the first time in the history of this great race, has driven to a brilliant victory at an average speed of over 101 miles per hour. Records are shattered. A new champion is born. DePaulo, Ralph Hepburn, and Wilbur Shaw were some of the big names in racing. But the biggest winner in the Depression era was Louis Meyer. He began as a mechanic. My brother was a dirt track uh, racing here in California. And small dirt track, miles, so forth. And he had a garage in Redland, California. And he came to Los Angeles to visit uh, Frank Elliott, who was a speedway driver and owned a speedway car. And he came by the house and picked me up. And I went over with Eddie to Frank Elliott's shop. And during their conversation over there, Mr. Elliott said that he was looking for some young fella to make the tour with him the coming season, which would be 1926. So I didn't say anything at the moment, but I was parked at Mr. Elliott's store at 7 o'clock the next morning. As Elliott's chief assistant and mechanic, Louis Meyer got his first taste of Indy in 1926. The next year, Elliott sold his Indy car. Meyer stayed with the car as a mechanic and relief driver for rookie Wilbur Shaw. Approximately 300 miles, uh, Wilbur came in and uh, wanted relief. I had what they call a, a temporary uh, driver's permit. And they put me in the car, and I drove the car for approximately 100 miles uh, while uh, Wilbur was resting, and he took the car back again, and uh, we finished fourth. Duesenbergs had won at Indy in 1924, 25, and 27. And for 1928, Louis Meyer was scheduled to race in one. Augie Duesenberg came to me one morning and said, the car is for sale. And we have a, a man who wants to buy the car. But he has his own driver, which is Ira Hall out of Terre Haute. Pretty hot chauffeur in them days. So the car was sold out from under me. Meyer's good friend, Alden Sampson, bought a car originally slated for Wilbur Shaw. 
and Myers started 13. Frank Elliott ran my pits in 1928, and he told me, he says, now, Louie, I want you to run 100 mile an hour. I don't want you to run 105 one lap or 110 and 95 the next. I want you to run 100 mile an hour all day, and you'll be in the first three. So we went by that. When I got over 100 mile an hour, they slowed me down, which was harder to drive the car at that speed than if I could have went maybe 106 or 8, something like that. That particular time. But we just stayed on that 100 uh, lap within a mile or two all the time. And uh, fortunately, uh, I was 100 miles to go, if I remember right. I was in third place. And uh, politely, uh, two cars fell out ahead of me. And I sit there in first place, and I couldn't do anything about it. Meyer went on to win in his first year as an entered driver. I got quite a few telegrams, but the person who got most of the telegram was Zeke Meyer. Zeke was driving in those days. His name was Zeke Meyer. And he came to be the next morning, and he had a, a two or three inch stack of telegrams. He said, look, <laughs> These are my friends who sent me a wire for winning the race. But <laughs> he, was, uh, he said, you could read them. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, Louis even had a car. We never corresponded in the month that he was back there. And uh, so I went to Banning to watch his brother's race car run. And Banning there has a racetrack there. And as I drove into the parking lot, they said, give Eddie Meyer the hand, the brother of Louis Meyer, the winner of Indianapolis. That real, really dumbfounded me. I was so surprised to think that that would happen. Uh -huh. The Speedway was originally built as a testing ground for production car manufacturers. And in 1930, new car restrictions were made to encourage the use of production engines. But when the race started, Louis Meyer was running with an experimental engine consisting of two bored-out straight-eight Millers mounted side by side. The first Samson engine. Meyer's car didn't handle well, though, and Billy Arnold led 198 laps to take the win. 31 and 32 were tough on Louis as he struggled with the Samson, completing only 61 laps total. Track conditions in the Depression era made Indy especially tough. Several drivers went over the wall and the brick paved surface made staying on the course a jarring experience. The bumps would change. The, the, the brick would swell up in one place, and boy, your car would kind of fly through the air, and pretty soon that bump was gone, but it raised someplace else. And uh, it, just beat, it just beat you to death. It was rough. And we didn't know what chocolate servers were in them days. And everything was taped down tight, and uh, you had what they call uh, scissor-type uh, Hartford shocker servers, and you cinched them up so they didn't work, so uh, you had a pretty rough ride. Struggling with the Samson didn't help much either. Louis Meyer would join Ralph Hepburn for 1933. It was one of them years the car felt real good. It, it just seemed like it was going to finish and everything, you know. And you didn't hear all them noises uh, that you hear the last 10 laps. Usually the last 10 laps, is, everything gets noisy. <laughs> you think your engine's going to fly out of the frame. And, uh, but everything went smooth and pretty soon. Louis took the lead on the 130th lap and never looked back, winning for the second time. Tommy Milton was the only previous two-time winner but he needed relief in his 1923 win, making Louis Meyer the first driver to win twice without relief. Every once in a while I have, I'll be at a banquet, and they want me to say something, and I'll get up and I'll say, because how many people in here remembers the 1933 banquet? 
and there'll always be a dozen hands fly up, you know. Well, our banquet in 1933 was lined up on the sidewalk, and they gave her your check and said goodbye. With all the hype and publicity surrounding the 500, promotion of cars or car-related products was a natural. In the 30s, Firestone would become heavily involved. Drivers discovered the potential for financial rewards by favoring certain products. Howdy, Louis. You ready for the race today? Well, here's one part of the car that's always ready. Say, Al, what's the secret of a champion? Right here. Fred, what kind of tires are you riding on? Why, by all means, Firestone. I have over $10,000 invested in this car and a little over three years' work, and I wouldn't rest my neck on anything else. Don't take any chances, Kelly. Not me, boy. Well, Wilbur, going to finish in the money today? Well, if we don't, it certainly won't be the fault of these babies. How's she riding, Ralph? Perfectly. On Firestone. Frank, what do you think of tires? Firestone. Put them on. Forget them. Hello, Chet. Lots of luck to you, boy. I'm not trusting to luck. I ride Firestone. Maury, what's the best thing on wheels here today? Right there is the best thing on wheels. Play it safe, Tony. I already have. Hey, Snowy. What do you think of Firestone? I think so much of Firestone tires that I wouldn't risk my neck on any other tire. Hi, Red. Gonna bring home new shoes for the baby. Ha <laughs> ha. My baby's got shoes. Firestone. Let's go, gang. Driving his own car, Louis Meyer started the race 13th. Frank Briscoe took the early lead as Meyer drove hard just to hold his position. Maury Rose and Bill Cummins gained on the top spot as Louis Meyer, still looking for extra speed, makes his first stop. By lap 92, Meyer was out, and Maury Rose had taken the lead, followed by Cummins. Late in the race, Cummins moved into first and took the checkered flag, with Rose finishing 27 seconds behind. A very close finish in 1934. Safety factor is always Firestone tires. I was worried about my gas leak consumption, but I wasn't worried about the tires because I used Firestone. In 1935, most drivers did worry about fuel consumption as total allotment for the 500 miles was cut from 45 to 42 and a half gallons. Meyer ran as high as second before fuel problems dropped him to 12, 17 minutes behind the winner, Kelly Patillo. Meyer completed the full 200 laps, as was required. All my races, actually, when you say that you think you could win it, I uh, always went in and figured on finishing. And every time I tried to win, something would happen, you know? So I thought the best way is to get in a race and play it as the race went along. That's the way I used to drive it. I didn't, uh, uh, there was times when I could have went much faster in all the races that I won. I could have went much faster. But there was a reason that I didn't. I wanted to finish the race. That attitude would help in 1936. Well, folks, there have been plenty of record-breaking crowds here at Indianapolis, but this is the biggest of them all. It's an hour until the race begins, and there are already more people packed into this huge field than attend even the largest football and baseball games. They've been arriving since last night, when lines began to form at field entrances. The turnstiles have been clicking steadily since the gates opened at 6.30 this morning, and thousands who have been waiting for hours rushed eagerly through. And now they're pouring in, in constantly increasing numbers, by automobile, motorcycle, and on foot. This field will seat over 65,000, and there's parking space for over 15,000 automobiles. Most of that space is already taken, and still they come. In 1936, Louis Meyer was driving a new car. He barely made the field on his final attempt, but he still relied on those Firestone tires. 
I refuse to take any unnecessary chances. I use the best tires I can buy, Firestone. I use Firestone tires exclusively in all my racing career. I've used them in over 100 race meets without ever having a tire failure of any kind. Uh, I've got two cars in this race, and believe me, they're both on Firestone. So today, every driver in the race uses Firestone tires, and has since 1929. He drove every tire off the speedway, but the gum dip Firestone tires. With the beating the tires get on this track, nothing but Firestone for me. As usual this year, I'm depending upon Firestone tires again. I can't risk a blowout. I use Firestone tires. At the start, Rex May stormed into the lead from the pole position. But the fuel allotment had been cut to 37 and a half gallons for the 500 miles. Careful monitoring of mileage would be the key. By lap 60, Babe Sapp had edged into the lead, and Louis Meyer was steadily moving into contention. Meyer pulled into the lead on lap 89, but after a pit stop on lap 131, he found himself chasing Ted Horn. Louis regained the lead at 146 laps, and as several drivers ran out of gas, Meyer cruised to the checkered flag, becoming Indy's first three-time winner. He won in record time. I didn't know what was going to run it. Ten laps or 200, you know. And sure enough, that thing ran the 500 miles, and we won her again. Uh, but it was not a race. Uh, we didn't have enough fuel to race and run 500 miles, none of us. 37 and a half gallons of gas. We have to average around 14 miles to the gallon. So I just hook a, everybody come by, I just hook a ride on the back of them. And I don't think that I ever open a throttle at any time over two thirds of the way. Because I knew that you would not finish at any speed that you'd like to run. So I just made a coasting job out of it. In 1938, Rex Mays, Wilbur Shaw, and Ted Horn were expected to battle for the pole. Louis Meyer, returning to a supercharged Miller, would start 12th. Early in the race, front runner Rex Mays dropped out. And just past the midway point, Ronnie Householder got relief from Billy Wynn. Meyer was running fourth at 149 laps when a broken oil pump knocked him out of the race. Floyd Roberts went on to win. With its international fame, the Indy 500 was becoming more and more showbiz, as evidenced by this 1939 presentation and the growing race day attendance. Jimmy Snyder became the first man to break the 130 mile an hour barrier to take the pole. Louis Meyer was second fastest and Wilbur Shaw qualified third. At the start, it was Snyder taking the lead but Shaw and Meyer weren't far behind. Snyder dropped off the pace as Shaw took the lead, and on lap 70, Meyer paced the field for the first time. Snyder regained the lead, but Louis Meyer was applying pressure. At lap 104, Meyer moved into first with Wilbur Shaw and Ted Horn taking chase. Jimmy Snyder dropped back to fourth and was hanging on as well. At the three-quarter mark, it was Meyer in the lead. There was only one other two-time winner at that time. Meyer was looking for win number four. At 182 laps, Wilbur Shaw took the lead and started to pull away. Meyer lost control but remained in the hunt. I passed him, that little Wilbur going down the straightaway, I just passed him like he wasn't there. I get on the turn with this car of mine, and I was struggling with it, and that Wilbur just drive right on around me picking his nose. Lap after lap that way. He wore me down. Shaw continued to lead on lap 197 when Meyer, desperately trying to catch up, lost control again, smashing through the fence. Louie was thrown out onto the track, but walked away from the accident. Louie was laying there and he said, uh, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, give me a drink. So I went over to the bottle of water and went to give him a drink and the doctor come over and called me out. He said, we don't want women in here, you just caused trouble. You just drowned him. He was he couldn't swallow because his tongue was so swollen. So then they started giving him attention, and we cut his clothes off, 
And because we always took, had to bring clothes along because the oil his was just soaked in his clothes. So we um, got him all cleaned up, and he was all right. But his back was a little bit uh, scratched. So I went to the garage and got his clean clothes, and we started looking for his shoes because he didn't have any shoes there at the hospital. And we looked all over, and the boys was helping me. And with that, the race car was towed in, and we were looking in the race car, and there set his shoes right on the pedal. He left his shoes right there. Wilbur Shaw held on for victory number two. And uh, I always said to myself, uh, the day comes when I can't not drive 500 miles by myself, I'm going to quit. And I did. I quit. Louis Meyer retired from Indy in 1939, but his influence lived on. After World War II, Meyer and friend Dale Drake purchased the Offenhauser plant, and virtually every car at Indy from the mid-40s through the 50s and into the mid-60s were Meyer Drake. From Maury Rose to Bill Vukovic to A.J. Foyt, Meyer has seen them all through the years. And as the speedway constantly changes, somehow it always stays the same. I can remember standing on the bridge and then I turned with some other drivers, and I was just a uh, mechanic for Frank Kelly in 1926 when Lockhart won. When DeRay and Lockhart get up to 120 miles an hour, they said, this is going too fast. Well, here it is over 60 years later, and they're still going too fast. That's what they're telling me anyhow. In the current days of 220 mile an hour speeds, it's hard to appreciate the dangers faced by the drivers of the Depression era. Drivers who circled the track at speeds half of what they are today. Well, there's tremendous admiration from afar because just knowing the business as I know it, having done uh, as much as I've done uh, or raced as much as I've raced, I can only appreciate a man like him that has won so much and, and so tenaciously won the events, three events here. Uh, yes, I, I have a lot of time for people like that. Showing a dominance never seen before at the Speedway, Louis Meyer set the precedent for the drivers of today. With the advances in technology, the improved track conditions, and the improved car safety, two- and three-time winners have become more routine. But Louis Meyer's accomplishments at Indy remain unblemished. I used to uh, go back to Speedway and almost cry when the boys left the starting line. The first year, I couldn't hardly take them. And, uh, you know, that's, and, uh, but then pretty soon that wears off. And uh, after about, when you haven't drove for about 10 years, you look down and say, I wouldn't get one of those things. <laughs> Louis Myers' outstanding achievements have become legends at the Indy 500, a race for heroes.